All right, so let's begin cycle 11, displaying the game UI. Now, before we begin, I imagine you're noticing a change has occurred, and that is exactly what has happened. So due to technical issues, we've had to re-record the last few learning cycles here. So cycles 11, 12, and 13 will be done uh, with this screen recording, as opposed to the original recording that was delivered at Unite Berlin. So all that really means is you're just going to hear things a little bit differently and see the editor a little bit differently. Also, we've updated the project to Unity 2018.2, and if you were following along with, say, .1, this should update to .2 without any issues or anything like that. It actually updates quite directly, so that's, that's nice. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with cycle 11. So what I want to do is I want to have a UI that's going to show me, you know, how many lives I've lost, maybe how long I've been playing, or maybe, you know, how many orbs are left in a level so I know what I need to find. And so I'm going to use Unity's UI tools to do that. And there's a lot of things we can do with UI tools here. And uh, the first thing I want to do is I'm just going to create some sort of generic UI just to play around with to kind of see how it works. And then we'll look a little bit more at how we will work with the actual game UI. So in my hierarchy here, I'm just going to go to UI, and I'm going to say maybe just for now, create an image. And that's going to do a couple things. So that's going to create a canvas. Uh, if I didn't already have one, uh, it's going to give me this image that I asked for, and it's going to create this thing called the event system. And that event system is the thing that's going to basically allow me to interact with my UI, either through keyboard and mouse or through touching the screen on a mobile device or whatever. And so the canvas uh, becomes this sort of large thing in the sky here. We can see the line of it here, and I'll actually just double-click it to zoom out. We'll see it's actually quite large, and it also sort of fits the format of my game view here uh, because my game view is in this free aspect, and I'll, I'll play around with that here in a moment. But So there we go. We can see this canvas there, and it is quite large in this sort of rendering mode. There are three, um, and when it's this large, it's basically one world unit, one unity unit for, for every pixel sort of in my screen here. And if I look at this canvas, I can see it's using this thing called a rect transform. And uh, here's the actual canvas component with this render mode screen space overlay. So it's basically being drawn as this giant overlay. I could do something like screen space camera, in which case it would tether itself to uh, a camera in, in my scene. So it'll actually sort of exist in 3D space. And then I could just say world space, which actually creates it as a, as a 3D object I can place in the world. Um, maybe think of like the screen on a computer or, you know, just sort of a, a heads up display over or not a heads up display, but an overlay over top of a character that you're looking at, like their health bar or something like that. And we have some uh, scalers and a graphic ray caster or whatever. We, we, we don't really need to dig into any of these. And for the fact of the matter is there's tons of information on the UI out there anyway. So we'll just leave that go for now. And then we have this image. And with the image, we're able to manipulate the rec transform because it's not bound uh, to our game view there, and I can see that I can I can move it around, and I've got this anchor, and I can move the anchor around, and when the you know the the anchor is positioned, and I've placed it uh, as the screen changes, we can see how that will affect uh, how this cube moves or how this box moves. So uh, where it's anchored to. So if I were to say anchor this all the way against the left of the screen there, um, I'll see that it could fall off my screen as my canvas size changed, uh, and how it will move relative to that that anchor. I also have the ability to split this anchor here. Uh, and what that allows me to do is it allows me now to track the corners of this image's bounding box to those anchor spots so the image will grow and resize, uh, even going negative if, uh, if my screen gets too small or whatever. And that's really just sort of the, the basics of the UI system. We basically, we place an anchor point where we want our UI image to uh, basically be anchored relative to, maybe this is something that'll anchor in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and then as my, my window resizes there, we can see it'll always sort of just stay in that upper left-hand corner. Uh, or we could split an anchor to set up zones or whatever and... That's really kind of it. And we have other things like buttons, but buttons are just images that have some additional functionality or text or whatever, but they all really follow the same premise. And I don't really want to dig into each individual UI element because again, that is something that, you know, there's tons of information on. We're really just looking at the things we need to achieve our goals right here. Now, before I move on with the UI stuff, one other thing I want to point out, uh, I had mentioned before this free aspect. And so when we're working on UI, uh, especially when we're dealing with mobile games where there's a whole bunch of different devices and you know, a lot of fragmentation there, it's really important to determine what sort of aspect ratio we're going to be utilizing uh, when 
we're, we're building these UIs because it can change quite greatly how something looks and behaves and performs. So free aspect has been great up till now, but perhaps I want to, you know, design with some target device in mind. Maybe uh, I'm aiming at like a four by three uh, iPad sort of scenario there, or maybe a, a, a 1080p, which is going to be a 16 by nine. I often like to design in 16 by 10, which is a nice sort of happy medium between 4.3 and 16.9. It gives me a nice middle of the road. But again, it really just depends on what, you know, what sort of devices you're using and how you're making that work. And you can see how that's gonna move where this black is in relation to what is on my screen based on how I have that one anchored, right? So it's really just sort of uh, up, up to us, up to you, up to whatever to decide, okay, these are the types of devices I'm going to build for and maybe just switch between these aspect ratios to test to say, okay, does this work, does this work, and whatever. All right, so I don't actually need this image there, so I'm gonna delete that, but I am gonna keep this canvas. And so this is going to be the canvas I'm gonna use for my, my sort of screen fader. And so my screen fader is pretty cool here. Uh, and so a few things I'm gonna do. First off, I want this canvas to appear in front of all other canvases because it's gonna, it's gonna fade out, right? So I'm gonna set this sort order to one, which means it's gonna appear on top of the other ones. Uh, otherwise, later when I have another canvas like that's gonna have my like heads up display stuff, that would appear even when the scene fades out. And I don't really want that to happen. The other thing that's gonna happen is I don't, I don't need this graphic raycaster component. What the graphic raycaster component does is it allows me to click on my screen or tap, tap my screen with my finger or whatever to basically raycast in from the screen into my UI to say, did I hit a button? Am I interfacing with a, a slider? Did I change a toggle or whatever? Well, this is just gonna be a fader canvas. And so it'll be more efficient if I just remove that component. I won't need it uh, because that's just gonna, you know, that that's just gonna end up blocking and reading inputs on something that, that doesn't need to be uh, messed with at all. And so now the next thing I'm gonna do is, so this, this canvas here is gonna be my fader canvas. And I can actually just rename this uh, to fader canvas. if I want there, uh, so that we can uh, just I easily identify what this is going to be. And I'm gonna go into my UI folder and I have this thing called a fader and I'm gonna see it has a rect transform here. And what this effectively is, is an image, just like the image we just saw. Um, the only real difference is that I have an animation sort of already set up on here and we're gonna take a look at exactly what that is. So I'm just gonna drag this fader and I'm gonna drop it onto my fader canvas. Now I wanna be careful not to drop it out here uh, anywhere else because this, like I had said before, is or has a rect transform and as such must go on a canvas. And if I drag it anywhere else, it's not gonna render and it's gonna just sort of mess up. So I'm gonna drag that here onto my fader canvas. And so there we go, we can see this fader image. And so we can see it's kind of dark here, uh, but all it really does is just sort of darkens there. It's using a lot of alpha channel. And so what can we do uh, with that? Uh, so right now there is, uh, you know, this fader, if I, I look here at the animations, I see I have fade idle, fade in, fade out. If I double click here, I can see what those are, fade in. So when the scene starts, it'll fade in, then it'll sit there and then it'll fade out the scene, basically uh, changing opacities and stuff like that. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my fader here and I am gonna take a look at this, uh, this material slot here. So this image is just using our default UI material where it's just gonna have some alpha overlay or whatever. But I'm actually gonna use a custom material and I'm gonna click on this little circle selector here. And the material I'm gonna look for is going to be my fader material right here. Now, when I select that, I'm gonna see that now my fader completely disappears, which is maybe a little odd. And let's take a look at what this fader material does. And so here we have this base texture, which is what we saw previously, and this ramp color, uh, and then this tint uh, variable here. And so what we basically are gonna have, this what this custom shader allows us to do, is as the alpha changes, we're gonna see it's gonna be applying that ramp. And so at full alpha, and then at zero alpha. And so the animations that we have as part of that animator on our fader are basically just saying, okay, well, let's fade from zero to one and then one back to zero. And instead of one, I'm mean 255, but uh, from you know 0% to 100%, fade in, fade out. There we go. And that's effectively what that's doing there. Uh, so that is a pretty cool effect. Uh, 
Now the last little bit we need is we're going to have a script that's going to tell this when it's time to actually fade in and fade out. So I'm going to go to my scripts here uh, and I am going to grab my fader script which is called scene fader right here and I'm just going to drag that onto my fader uh, right there we go. And so we go, and there's that fader. What the scene fader is basically gonna do is it's going to say, okay, so what's our animator? What's the parameter? Grab our animator, grab the, the, the string to hash to make this more efficient. And we're gonna say, hey, game manager, this is your scene fader. And so then the game manager later can say, oh, it's time to fade the scene, so call fade scene out. And it's just gonna trigger that, that parameter there, and fade the scene out. So there we go. And so I'll save my scene, let's run it here. And when I hit play, we should see the scene fade in, there we go. And if we were to go and die now, and I apologize for my loud keyboard here, boom, fade out, and then fade back in when it resets. There we go, pretty awesome. Now the next thing, or the last thing I'm gonna do here is I have another sort of prefab set up. That's basically just some images for me, just to save some time. And this is in and of itself its own canvas. So I'm just gonna drop this here in my uh, hierarchy there. And what we're going to see is that's going to add an image for our number of orbs, a text element, which if I expand here, I can see uh, I have this image, same as the images we've been seeing, some text, which is just this text mesh pro text. All right. And then the number of deaths and the time. And then there's this thing called game over text, uh, which we can't see, but when we can, it's just going to say game over. Um, and that's what it's going to say basically when we win. Uh, and so we know that we are done playing. Now this UI manager basically just has controls to, that sets text, right? So basically it's a singleton, just like our game manager. Uh, and what it's basically gonna say is, all right, so let's update the orbs UI with the current count, or let's update the time UI with the current time, or uh, let's update the death UI with the number of deaths or whatever. And that's all it really is. And the calls to the UI manager already exist throughout the code. Uh, and so now that, it, now that it exists in our scene, we'll see that our UI will automatically just begin updating. And so again, if I hit play, what I'm gonna see is now I can see there's three orbs. I've died zero times. This is my time played. And if I grab an orb, I have fewer orbs now. And then if I die, we'll see that goes up to one. And there we go. Now, again, one of the key elements here was setting the fader canvases sort order to one. If I had said, you know, maybe had this UI, uh, my, my UI manager to be the higher sort order when I died, it, we would still be able to see it over top of that overlay like that, which we don't really want to happen. So that's why we had set our our fader canvas to a higher sort order than the default sort order of zero, which is what the UI manager had. Okay, so that is the step uh, cycle 11 displaying the game UI. And so what you are going to do is you are going to add a canvas to your scene by going to create UI and canvas. And then on the canvas component, you're gonna set the sort order property to one. And you can go ahead and remove the graphic raycaster component on that canvas uh, because we're just, we don't need to click it, it's just for our fader. Next thing you're going to do is you're going to drag the fader prefab, uh, which is in the UI folder, onto the canvas in the hierarchy view. Remember, it, the fader prefab is a rect transform, so you have to drag it onto a canvas. And you're going to apply the fader material to the material property of the image component on the fader, and you're going to add the scene fader script to the fader game object. Finally, you're going to drag the UI manager prefab into the scene or the hierarchy. It won't really matter where you place it uh, since it's an overlay. Uh, and then you'll be able to save your scene, hit play, and see everything updating like it should.